Hello, and welcome to Asia Society's Own Voices Virtual Reading Room. We are delighted that you are joining us today for a very special reading of The Library Bus. The Library Bus explores the education experienced by girls in war torn countries and their resilience and ingenuity in overcoming them. Our featured author today is from Afghanistan. Bahram Rahman will provide a reading followed by a discussion about his experience and inspiration for writing the book. We hope you enjoy. The Library Bus by Bahram Rahman, that is me, illustrated by Gabriel Gurmard and published by Pajama Press. Arrange the books. Clean up. Be nice to the other girls. Paris repeats under her breath. You will be great, Mama says, giving Paris a hug. Today is Paris' first day as Mama's library helper. But this is no ordinary library. This one is on wheels. And it is the only library bus in all of Kabul. Instead of seeds, it has so many books that Patty can barely count them all. The streets are still dark when Patty and Mama leave home. Their first stop is a small village tucked in a valley between two gray mountains. A fiery sun rises over the passing fields. A group of girls stands under a giant oak tree, waiting patiently. One little girl waves her chatter. Over here, she shouts. Harry opens the back door and everyone climbs inside. The girls return the books they borrowed last week and search through the shelves for new books to read. Salam, my girls. Let's make a circle now. Mama says in a calm voice. Everyone pays attention. We are going to practice some English. First, they sing the alphabet song. Then they count from one to 10. When the lesson ends, a girl in a yellow dress skips over to Patty. Are you new here? She asks. What's your name? Do you live here on the bus? Can you print ABC? I can print the letters all the way to Z. She talks very fast. I can print them too, Perry says quickly. But Perry can't even read or write in Farsi yet. Farsi is the language people speak in Afghanistan. Mama starts the bus. Boop, vroom. And they're off to a refugee camp beyond the mountains. The old city spreads out in front of them like the colorful embroidered scarves in the Grand Bazaar. Tiny houses, dusty roads, one hill after another, and then a ring of ragged mountains. Paris fidgets with her zipper. When did you learn ACD, Mama? She asks, oh, you mean ABC? That's the English alphabet, just like Aleph, Be, Te in Farsi. Mama takes a deep breath. Grandpa taught me a long time ago. When I was young, girls were not allowed to go to school, to learn, to read or write. I had to hide in the basement to study. Harry wonders if Mama was ever afraid in Grandpa's basement. 
it is always dark down there. Patty, when you go to school next year, I want you to study hard. Never stop learning. Then you will be free. Tell me now, she adds with a wink. How does learning make you feel? Free, Paris screams, rising her arms in the air. It's midday when they arrive at the camp. Perry sees rows and rows of tents. There's dust everywhere, and the kids have patches on their clothes. Mama announces those who need notebooks and pencils go to Perry, and those exchanging books come to me. Paris is surrounded by a crowd of girls asking for school supplies. I need a new pencil, a curly-haired girl shouts. Another girl squeezes her way to the front of the line. Give me a notebook, she says, jumping up and down with excitement. Soon, everyone is ready for a lesson. A, B, C, D. Repeat after me one more time. Mama makes it sound like a beautiful song. A, B, C. Paris sings to herself very softly. As they leave the camp, Paris reads the large letters written on the tents. W, F, P. And the next one is U, N, H, C, R. These are the acronyms for some of the organizations helping children in Afghanistan. Good job, Perry, Mama cries. You got them right. Perry beams with pride. Back at home, Patty helps Mama make dinner, a bowl of hearty bean shorba with chunks of potato and carrot. At the table, she asks, next year, will you teach me to read? Mama says, you will go to a real school in the city. Why can those girls go to a real school too? Patty asks. There are no schools for girls in the village or the camp. They only have the library bus once a week, but I will help them the same way your grandpa helped me. At bedtime, Mama kisses Perry's forehead. You did well today. Perry smiles and gives Mama a snug hug. She thinks about the girls in the village and the girls in the camp. She thinks about the library bus, the new places they will go, and the new girls they will meet tomorrow. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the reading of the library bus. And lucky for us today, we have the author of the book, Baharam Rahman. I know I don't pronounce it the way I should all the time, but we're so excited to have you here today. And um, what I'd love to do is take a few minutes just to ask you a few questions about your motivation for writing the book. Um, any other uh, points of interest that you may want to share with us about um, growing up in Afghanistan, uh, what you're currently doing now, the work that, you know, that motivates you today. And, um, you know, let, let's just get started now. Sound okay? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Well, okay, thank great. you so much. Thank you so much, Neelam, for having me and just sharing my story with your uh, audience uh, through your platform. Uh, this is this is a privilege, to be honest. Like, mm -hmm. if you are able to tell your stories or the stories of your people, that is that is a privilege, which I'm so grateful for that. Uh, so. As the, probably at the back of the book, so this is my first um, children's book. So uh, I hope I have done justice to the story. Uh, the story is uh, it's very close to my heart in some ways because this is something that 
I missed uh, when I was looking for literature for my nephew and nieces and children in my family. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I hope that everyone liked it and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the questions now. Oh, great, wonderful. And one of the um, exciting things about the Own Voices virtual reading room is that many of our authors say the exact same thing that you just said, which is, you know, growing up, you didn't see these types of stories. You don't see these stories for your children or in your case, your nieces and your nephews. And that was kind of a main driver or a motivator for writing the book. Um, and I think, you know, when that happens, there's just so much passion behind it. And it's usually a story that is so important to tell. And so I, I appreciate your, per, you know, sharing that perspective. Um, so let's just get started. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, sure. So I was born in Afghanistan in the middle of the 80s. Uh, so I, I was born in a fairly large South Asian, Central Asian family, kind of, I would say, I have uh, five siblings. Um, and at that time, we were living in a like in my grandfather's house, and it's like an intergenerational household. I had aunts and uncles and everyone around us. So for me, um, childhood was an interesting time because in some ways, we were so protected, even though so much was going on outside our walls, I would say. Uh, Afghanistan was of, occupied by the, the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, and and it was it was a very, very interesting time. And so um, the one other interesting part of that, like it's about my parents. So my father was uh, working in the radio television of Afghanistan, which at that time was the only news channel in Afghanistan. Uh, and my mom was a teacher. So it's kind of the, the two blend of like bringing the stories and reading together to us and just keeping us very safe and protected uh, in, a, in a time of crisis. <laughs> So I, I honestly think that my childhood, was, considering the circumstances, was quite normal because we always talked about what was going on in some ways. And my parents tried to teach us about uh, like different values of like traditional values and Afghan values and understanding of human dignity, and the power of, for example, the stories. Um, but one thing which I missed uh, when I was growing up it was uh, having books to read. Like there are a lot of like, there's a, um, so, Persian culture, which I come from, uh, is predominantly uh, influenced by oral stories, stories you hear from your mother, grandmother. And so there's not a lot of books that uh, for children there, or at least when I was growing up. And the books that were there, my parents were not too keen for us to read them because there were elements of like uh, propaganda, for example, in them. So he wanted us to, to learn and uh, read things that are suitable for children. So I grew up, you, you, you probably will be surprised or maybe not, that reading stories that my father read as a child. So I have a copy of those mm -hmm. that, with you. So this is kind of a, an old copy collection of children's stories from Afghanistan from 60s and like 50s. Wow. Uh, it's these like children magazines which were then stopped. Uh, they stopped the publication once the communist government comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, I would say uh, the civil war happened. And so I did most of my school years, I would say, uh, during the Bojahideen and civil war during the uh, then the rise of the Taliban and the, the time that the Taliban uh, ruled Afghanistan uh, for the first time. And I'm so sad, honestly, and unfortunate to say that they are back in power, but um, that is the story of Afghanistan, so. Yeah, right, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think it's just really fascinating that you just pulled up those uh, old uh, stories. Um, and, you know, I hope you'll probably never let them go because they're worth so much and they bring so many great memories, right? Really amazing. Thanks for sharing that with us. So the next question I have for you is, um, what was the inspiration for writing the book? You share some of your history um, about your background, but what really inspired you to write this particular story? So uh, one of the main reasons um, was I always try to find a way to talk about like my experience of growing up with my 
nephew and nieces and other children that I met outside Afghanistan. The, there's a, such a disconnect, I would say, between what people might think children would be doing or living than what they're actually doing. So um, what usually you get information about Afghanistan is on the newspaper or like through like some sort of investigative or humanitarian kind of perspective. You never see the stories from the, the human side of it. You never see it from or rarely see it uh, being presented in a more dignified way, I would say. Um, I'm not questioning the entire journalism like, uh, work journalistic work that has been do, been um, happening in Afghanistan, but it's, there's always so much more than just suffering and human suffering, especially in a time of war. Um, so when I was uh, visiting my parents in 2018, it was after like a quite a long separation that we were visiting. Uh, and we visited Sri Lanka because I couldn't go back to Afghanistan at that time. And I still can't go back to Afghanistan for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so my parents flew from Afghanistan to Sri Lanka. I flew from Canada to Sri Lanka and we met there. And, and we talked about like, what would, for example, my nephew and nieces would like know about us, like the time he grew up. But they're all like born in Canada or UK or Ireland. So they have no real sense of who we are. Uh, so that became kind of the impetus to, to start looking for stories that are kind of reflective of that experience, which as I said at the beginning, unfortunately I couldn't find many good ones. So I thought maybe I should just write one for them. So. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so your family, is located all over the West, I would say, right? They're, yes, they're, yes. Okay. So, so my family is probably like so many other Afghan families. Uh, we uh, kind of scattered in the middle of kind of late 90s to different parts of the world. Uh, so there was a time that we, uh, we are a family of seven. Um, so the, we were in five countries. Uh, and even today, so my sister and I, we live in Canada. Uh, I have a brother in Ireland and I have a brother in London, UK, and I have a brother and my parents are in Germany. So we are in wow. five countries. Yeah. And it's not by choice because at different stage of time and based on circumstances, whoever could get out and just got out to, to find a home or feel safe. So um, I would say it's a very similar story to um, all other Afghans or probably other immigrant and refugee communities um, across the world. So, And have you been able to connect with other Afghans in your own community or, you know, your family? Have they kind of, um, you know, settled in a place where there are a lot of other um, Afghan refugees or how have they kind of tried to maintain their culture and their heritage um, from so far away? The, there's, a, there's an interesting, this is a very interesting question because then it, it's like in some ways we are experiencing like a different versions of multiculturalism in these different Western countries. So uh, I, I would say like, I really like, like living in, in Canada and I think Canada is kind of my home. If I think about home, like Toronto is probably home for me because I've never spent uh, kind of this, um, uninterrupted phase of my life in Afghanistan. So it has always been something happening. We have been moving here and there internally or outside. So this is like, I have been in Canada since 2012. And this is the longest uninterrupted time in my entire life. So you can imagine <laughs> this would be home. Um, but it's uh, like, we try to connect through um, their community centers and networks, but we have a like strong um family uh, kind of network and friends. Uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, I come from a very big family. So uh, to be honest, I sometimes can't catch up with my aunts and uncles and cousins. So um, in some ways we are quite grateful of having them and, uh, and having that connection of feeling of home. Yeah. Uh, and in, in Toronto, you there, if you go a little bit north of like where I live, you, you have a whole uh, kind of like a district of Iranian and Afghans. And so you can find everything from all sorts of spices and childhood candies or ice cream that we ate. So it's, it's 
it's pretty amazing. So yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. <laughs> um, okay, so let's dig into the book a little bit um, and talk a little bit about um, some of the characters. So in the book, Pari's mother talks about having to hide in her grandfather's basement to study. Um, mm. That was a very interesting point of the book and something um, I think that a lot of young people today may not um, know that something like this was happening, or maybe in some cases it's still happening. Um, is that something the women in your family experience in particular? And you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, which the sad thing is it's happening once again in Afghanistan, something that we never thought it will happen again. Um, but yes, so my, as I said at the beginning, like my mom was a teacher, so she taught high school uh, students, girls. Um, and when the Taliban came, she couldn't go back, uh, she couldn't go to, she was not allowed to go to, to teach. My sister was, um, was a, a university student, she had to stop. Uh, I had cousins that they couldn't go to school from elementary to high school. And it was a very difficult time, I would say, for all of us because we were witnessing like, uh, half of our family being uh, restricted, being absolutely not allowed to pursue the dreams that they had. And, and, and for me, like I always uh, I've said it to my family that honestly, as a man, I feel quite guilty and, and embarrassed about it because there were times that we were allowed to go to school and do things even though I think the quality of that education is questionable or the freedom of to choose things, but at least we could just go, yeah. They were not allowed to do that. And they got really, some of them really got depressed and sick and which was very, very difficult um, for us. Then um, at one point later in 90s, um, we kind of decided that we should send some of them to Pakistan. So part of our family then moved from Afghanistan to Pakistan to provide that kind of like an education for some of the girls. And, uh, and then again, story of all immigrants, we ended up in different countries. And I'm so proud to say that all of them are now such like great professionals and like in the, whatever field they are doing from doctors to engineers and physicians and all sorts of. Yeah, that's, that's really great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the refugees and the refugee camps in Afghanistan? You have some images in the book uh, where the illustrator depicted some of the, um, some part of the story regarding the refugee camps. And can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your experience? Um, have you been to those camps? What life is like in those camps? And, um, you know, why you chose to include that piece in the book? Well, as someone who identifies as a refugee myself, so I think being a refugee is like who I am. And um, and in Afghanistan, I would have to say that like the history of being a refugee or people being forced to leave their homes is, is quite long now. It's almost like 50 years. Uh, so what happened, the, the the refugee camps that I have mentioned in the book. So these are um, some of the camps that were created um, in after 2003, when uh, uh, when the situation was uh, slightly peaceful, and then we had an influx of uh, people who wanted to come back from neighboring countries, from Pakistan or Iran or other places. So, uh, but at the same time, the country, especially in the southern part of the country, uh, there was still an active war going on. So a lot of villages were displaced. So it's kind of these camps were some of the uh, like a mix of internally displaced individuals and and uh, people who returned back and they, they lost everything during the civil war or during the Taliban. So they had no home or no nothing to go to. Um, so I, uh, with some of my friends and especially a, a British friend, she's an... Um, fantastic woman, uh, she used to come with uh, bags of uh, toys and then we had we you go to market and buy school supplies and all those things. And we went, um, we did regular rounds to these places and then um, try to find and they give the kids something other than, um, other than something essential or basic, I would say, something that would, they can read or they can dream. So it, it shouldn't be something 
they, they were organizations helping them with food and other things, but there was this lack of being a child for them. So, mm-hmm. so that is what we wanted, uh, we were trying to do, and it was amazing. And um, I still like remember their faces, their wonderful faces. Uh, I hope they're all fine and doing well and wherever they might be. And I think that is, that's why they, they drove me to, to do this work. So. Yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Um, and you know, do you have a message for our audience about the education for women and girls in Afghanistan? Something that, um, you know, of course the book depicts, um, you know, some of the problems uh, obviously that the girls are facing there and have faced. Um, Anything that we don't know and that you'd like to share with us or some new perspective that we may not necessarily get, as you mentioned, from the news or, you know, from the regular media sources, anything that you'd like to share? I, uh, I would say the path to uh, develop Afga- Afghanistan is through investing in women and, cho- and girls. Like the, um, if you look at the country, the country from the day the women were not allowed to realize their full potential, that is the day all miseries of Afghanistan started. So, so I would say invest um, in women's education, women's health, um, their improved rights, financial abilities to, to make their own like income. And, and I understand that at this time, it is very difficult for international organization and uh, international community to support like a government that is run by the Taliban and it's with all the problems. But let's just don't forget there are like more than 30 million people who live there and they are absolutely worth everything that we can provide them and help them. Um, and I'm absolutely sure they will do it. They will do absolutely amazing. And we have seen examples of it. So don't forget Afghan women. Please don't forget Afghan people um, and, and continue supporting them. Yeah. Thank you. No, I really appreciate that message. I think some of the stories that we highlight here the own voices uh, reading room does exactly that. We don't want people to forget different voices. We don't want them to forget the voices of women and girls. And I think what is so inspiring and exciting about this current day is that there are so many authors that are depicting the experiences of young girls and young women, women of color, girls of color. And I think that is um, probably one of the most important things that a children's book author can do. So I, I really appreciate um, everything that you've done. Um, the story is beautiful, but I think it also provides um, our youngest readers with a glimpse as to, you know, what Afghanistan is and not in, as you mentioned earlier, you know, in this way that is, um, oh, you know, it's so sad and it's just that there's so, such misery there, but there is also life and people are happy and people are, you know, trying to do the best that they can. And I think um, that's a really important message and I appreciate you spending some time with us today. Um, is there any other final message that you have for our audience or something that you'd like to share? Keep reading Afghan books and uh, they are amazing. There are so much talent. And if you can learn Persian, that's even fantastic. So, uh, and thank you so much for having me. It was, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And Absolutely. You are- yes, no pleasure to speak with you as well. And I just want to also mention to our audience, you have a new book coming up. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. We have it right behind you there. Right. The sky blue bench. And so is that available yet or is it only pre-sale? Where, where are you right now? Well, uh, it's still pre-sale. So it will come out, uh, I think, on the 30th um, of this month. Okay. So if you need Christmas shopping, this is it. <laughs> Absolutely. And let's have you back um, after the new year to read that story and share that with our audience. Fantastic because this okay. is uh, this is absolutely based on my one of some of my personal experiences of ni- uh, in during 1993. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I always dramatize things a little bit here and there and change their characters. But this is uh, I hope you will like this book also this, as much as you love this one. So yeah, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. No, that would be great to have you back. So, Bahram, I want to thank you again, and um, we hope to see you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.